Abiola, Nigeria. Musakua, Cambodia. Annabella de Leon, Guatemala. Oynes McCormick, Northern Ireland. Farida Azizi, Afghanistan. Marina Piskatova Parker, Russia. Mukhtar Mai, Pakistan. So now we're sitting around together in a small dark room in a community hall in Northern Ireland and we're reading the Declaration of Human Rights out loud. And we get to the word inalienable and it's hard to pronounce. And the women start laughing and think maybe I said aliens and I'm talking about outer space. And I say it's hard to spell too. But what does it mean anyhow, one woman asks me. That word inalienable. It means these rights were written, they're part of every human being. What do we do to have to get these rights, she asks. They're yours, I tell her. She looks at me amazed. Well, that's the best fucking kept secret in the whole world, is all I can say. On the days I give audience, Monday and Friday, my God, I can enter my office. A line, groups of 20, 40 people are waiting for me. They come from all over the Republic. Go on, tell me a problem. Necesito la medicina para mi madre, que es muy vieja. Terry, please get me director of the General Hospital because Mrs. Posada needs medicine for her mother and they didn't give her any. I have a phone with that wire. <laughs> El director del hospital. Annabelle de Leon. How are you? Fine, okay. Everybody answers my call because they know I'm not playing. Here is Mrs. Posada. You didn't give her medicine for her mother? She's presenting to me the prescription in this moment. I need you to solve this problem, okay? You're saying you're going to send me the medicine. No, she's going to go there now and you're going to give her the medicine and then she's going to call me again when she has the medicine, okay? Okay. Thank you very much because if you don't give her medicine, I'm going to call into the plenary, okay? <laughs> bye bye. Your problem is solved. Please call me again when you have your medicine. Okay, the next. Please, what can I do for you? In the night wind, when I think of home, I think of mountain shadows as I hide in the borders of Afghanistan to walk so many times at night. It is the faces of the women that will always move me, guide my footsteps to the landmarks. I see a woman giving birth all by herself because under Taliban, male doctors are forbidden to treat the women and women cannot be trained as doctors. I see her face as she dies in front of my eyes. And I cannot stay calm. What can I do? The only way to bring basic health care to these women is to walk. Sometimes at night to regions so remote. So I smother myself and my two small sons under my burqa to try to bring health care. The burqa can be a good thing to disguise myself. When I feel the Mujahideen watching me across the mountains, I find they are not all against the women. Sometimes they tell us where the landmines are or not to go a certain way. There might be thieves. Crisis Center for Women, how may I help you? I heard you on the radio. You did? I heard you on the radio. You were telling my story. Yes. My husband, my husband is beating me. He has beaten me for 26 years. Where are you? I'm in bed with a broken back from him beating me. Please, tell me your address. I heard your voice. You sounded like someone I could trust. Tell me how to get to you so I can send help. Girl, my husband is very powerful. He's in one of the government agencies. I will come and bring the police. You don't understand. If you tell someone, he will tell find me. Out. Before you can get to me, I'll be dead. She calls for about a month, and then she stops calling. She's one of the ones I could not save. Cormac, a malicious spirit, and Pralang is a soul. All these years, I did not know that in our culture in Cambodia, we are supposed to have 19 souls. Every part of our body has a soul, hair, feet. I asked victims of trafficking. When did you lose that soul? They said their souls left when trafficker took them away from their families. 
that their souls are still in the rice field. When you are raped, you lose your prolong, someone taken away. I've been working with trafficked women since I became Minister of Women's Affairs in 1998. Until that time, only men held that position. The first things I did was challenge an old Cambodian proverb, a man is a gold, woman is a white piece of cloth. Think of it. If you drop the gold in the mud, you can clean it and it will be shinier than before. But if your piece of cloth is stained, it is ruined. If you've lost your virginity, you cannot be a white piece of cloth. Every year, more than 30,000 Cambodian children are forced into prostitution. Girls as young as 11 are tricked, promised a job to help their poor families, then taken away to become sex workers. I'm now working one of them, a girl called Moni. How? How did I come to speak out? Well, I was living in the U.S. And you know how American society is? I mean, very nice people, but they don't know a lot about any other place. Even in America or Canada, their nearest neighbor. So what is the chance of them knowing anything about Nigeria and care? It was 1995, and I was in my second year at Harvard, and I had just finished class when I see students petitioning. And I know it would be something really ridiculous, like wanting to walk barefoot on campus on Sundays. And I'm trying to avoid them. But they're persistent. And they stop me. And only because I'm black. And they say to me, we are getting signatures. We have a petition. The elected president of Nigeria is in jail. And I say to them, don't you know you are getting signatures for my father? <laughs> about the situation of Nigeria. I thought nobody would hear, but they cared, they listened. And that is how I began to find my voice. My father took me away from school at 16 and put me to work as a clerk in his one-man printing business. It was very constricting. I wanted to go to university, but I knew my family wouldn't let me, so I left home. I got a bed sit and applied for a lowly civil servant position. At the interview, I am asked... What do you think of homosexuals? What? What would you do if your brother married a black woman? Offensive questions that are not the real question. Which is, what do you think about Catholics? I am from a unionist Protestant background myself. I wouldn't have known a Catholic until I was 18. I remember a conversation in the office about a Catholic who'd gone for promotion and how you couldn't have that because Catholics couldn't be trusted. And I realized this conversation can only take place because there aren't any Catholics in the office. Northern Ireland was a profoundly unjust place to live. It still is. It's a very cold house for the poor. In the North, if you want to challenge injustice and you are not on the side of the status quo, you have to be on the other side. A very rigid power system. I remember a relative of mine saying, Enough! You have 